بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد respected brothers and sisters and ulama assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh the theme of today's conference is the legacy of the ulama the scholars of the Indian subcontinent. I've been told to say a few words about the contribution of the ulama of the Indian subcontinent in the field of hadith. This is a very particular and academic topic and so I don't really wish to just provide you with a list of names of scholars and their works that's more befitting a written piece but i will tell you a bit about hadith and its sciences in india and begin with a brief introduction to hadith itself and its importance and value and what and this is what prompted scholars of the indian subcontinent amongst others to devote their lives and their energies and resources and time to the field of hadith we all know more or less what hadith is these are the words and the sayings and the actions and the details of the life of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam hadith holds a very important position in Islam second only to the Quran and in fact the Quran cannot be understood without the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a number of verses Allah mentions the functions of his prophets prophethood the duties of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam in one verse such as in surah al-jum'ah Allah says huwa alladhi ba'atha fil ummiyin rasulan minhum yatlu alayhim ayatihi wa yazakkihim wa ya'allimuhum al-kitab wa al-hikmah it is he Allah who sent amongst the unlettered people a messenger from themselves who recites to them his verses and who purifies them and who teaches them the book and wisdom in other verses of the holy quran the same three categories and functions of the messenger's prophethood sallallahu alaihi wasallam are mentioned that his duty as a messenger primarily consisted of three things one reciting the verses of allah to the people two again and again the quran says wa yu'allimuhumul kitab wal hikmah and to teach them the book and wisdom and the third function was to purify them or more a better translation and explanation would be to help them grow and flourish that's the real meaning of tazkiya but as the second of these three duties states the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's second function after conveying the words of allah 
and reciting them to his companions and to the creation was to explain those very same words, to teach the people the book which he conveyed to them and which he brought, and to teach them wisdom. The Qur'an is a raw mine of information. Allah invites us to understand the Qur'an without doubt. In fact, in one verse, the very purpose of the revelation of the Qur'an is to understand it. Kitabun anzalnahu ilaykum mubarakun liyaddabbaru ayatih wa liyatadhakkaru ulul albab A book which we have revealed to you, which is blessed, so that, and this is a purpose, the very reason of the revelation of the Qur'an, so that they may reflect over its verses and the ones who possess intelligence may take heed. So the very purpose of the revelation of the Qur'an according to this verse and others is that so that people may reflect on its verses, ponder over its meanings and absorb them and be admonished by them. So indeed Allah invites us to understand the Qur'an but as Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas said as is reported of him that there are four categories of understanding the Qur'an. One, the first is something which everybody understands. I'm paraphrasing. These are simple messages. Two, a higher grade of understanding which is reserved for those who know the intricacies and the complexities of the Arabic language, the subtleties and the nuances of the Arabic language. And then number three, a higher grade. This higher grade of understanding the Qur'an is reserved only for the select ulama who combined with their common wisdom and their mastery of the Arabic language and their mastery of the other sciences of Islam are able to derive meanings from the Holy Qur'an. And the fourth category is لَا يَعْلَمُهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ only Allah knows. So when we are invited to understand the Qur'an and each person, as each person tries to understand it, there's a limit. There's only so much you can actually understand. Even if you know Arabic, you could be a master of Arabic. But to understand the Qur'an thoroughly is beyond just knowledge of the Arabic language. Who was greater, who was more proficient in language than the Sahaba radiallahu anhum themselves. And yet, they were reliant upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in order to understand the Holy Qur'an. So how do we understand the Qur'an? Well, this is it. Allah says, one doesn't just understand the Qur'an merely by reading it. Of course, you understand some parts of it. And those parts are what provide guidance but not in its entirety, to understand the Qur'an as it should be understood, to learn the Qur'an as it should be learned, and to come to know the Qur'an in order to apply its meaning and message that can only be achieved through the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why in these verses, immediately after saying that he recites the verses of Allah to the creation, the second thing he does is, وَيَعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ and he teaches them the book and wisdom. That was his second duty. And where do we find the teaching of the book and the wisdom referred to in these verses? That is what we find in the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is contained. That sunnah is contained in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The hadith isn't just restricted to the words of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The hadith speaks about everything in relation to him. His words, his utterances, his actions, his behavior, his silent approvals. 
his tacit approvals, his explicit approvals, his life, his character, his conduct, his manner of eating, sitting, sleeping, his travelling, all of these things that cover the life of Rasulullah are known as the hadith. And since a believer is required to love the Messenger more than he loves his own parents, his children, and in fact his own soul. From the very beginning, from the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam till today, Muslims in general, out of their love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, have a special affinity with the hadith. And the ulama in particular have a deep-rooted love for the words, the actions, and the seerah, and the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why from the very beginning till today, Muslims have devoted themselves to the study of the life of Rasulullah alayhi salatu was salam. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi and others relates from Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha that she was asked, what was the khuluq of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? The word khuluq can be loosely translated into all of the following and much more for it incorporates all of these meanings and much more what was the khuluq of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam his character his manners his conduct his personality so umm mu'minin aisha radiyallahu anha rather than give a very elaborate reply to the word to the question what was the khuluq of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Her simple reply was, Kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an. The khuluq of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the Qur'an. He was a living, breathing, walking, tafsir, exegesis and explanation of the Qur'an itself. He was a... He was a living embodiment of the teachings of the Holy Qur'an. The khuluq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa were the Qur'an. This is why, in order to understand the Qur'an, one has to study the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To get to the Qur'an, one has to go through the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In order to appreciate the meanings and the teachings of the Qur'an and to successfully apply them, one has to look at the example and the words and the explanation of the Messenger wasallam. This is why hadith has always held such a prominent and principal position in Islam. I've given this brief introduction, I've said these few words, because, unfortunately, as predicted by the Messenger wasallam. There have always been calls in the Ummah, and there continue to be calls, to abandon the Hadith and to detach it from the Qur'an and to suffice with the Qur'an itself. And throughout history, one cannot understand fiqh, one cannot understand religion without the Hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, the bulk of information in Islam comes from the Hadith. Fiqh is derived from the Hadith and the Qur'an. But the bulk of information for, for Fiqh and for all the other sciences comes from the Hadith, not from the Holy Qur'an. And so Hadith has always been the focus and the devotion of the ulama of Islam. In fact, if you look at the title of Imam Bukhari, Rahmatullahi alayhi famous collection of Hadith, most ulama, at least in later centuries, have regarded the collection of Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi, as being the most authentic collection of hadith. And his title for his book is not just Sahih al-Bukhari, that's an abbreviated title used by others. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi's own title for his hadith book and collection is al jamiul al-Musnad al-Sahih al-Mukhtasar min umuri Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sunanihi wa ayyamih which means the authentic, compact, the compact, authentic, ascribed compendium 
of the words or of the affairs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his traditions and his days. This is a comprehensive title because it covers the life of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and that I mention this because the title illustrates for us the real meaning of hadith, not just his words. And the collection of Imam Bukhari is vast, it's huge. According to one numbering, it's approximately 7,400 hadith, although uh, most of them are repeated, but individually, over 2,000 hadith. Well, over 2,000 hadith. And this is the cream of the crop, according to Imam Bukhari. Not the only ones that he considers to be authentic, but the cream of the crop. And he actually says, the Sahih hadith, the authentic, reliable hadith, which I have left out of my collection are greater in number than the ones I have included. And the interesting thing about this title is, he says his book, despite being vast, it's still compact and abbreviated and shortened. It's a compendium, but it's compact. What I'm trying to show is that the c collection of hadith in its entirety, is the actual seerah and the tafsir of the Holy Qur'an. And it's the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why ulama have devoted themselves to that topic and to that study. Out of love for Rasulullah alayhi salatu wa salam. The Sahaba radiyallahu anhum did it and those after them did it. Imam Khatib al-Baghdadi rahmatullahi alayhi has compiled a book. Many of you will have heard of it. It's called Ar-Rihlatu fi Talab al-Hadith. Journeying in search of hadith. And in there he collects many accounts with chains of narration back to the scholars, the tabi'i, the tabi'un, the successors to the companions, to the companions themselves. All of these stories in, the, in his collection of journeying for the search of hadith, all of them are to do with the companions and the successors to the companions who travelled far and wide, who undertook lengthy, arduous journeys, all in the hope of listening to the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's a large collection. The remarkable thing about this collection of stories is every single narration, more or less, which he includes in that book is not about the companions and the tabi'un, the successors to the companions, or the tabu'ud tabi'in, the successors to the successors, traveling in order to gain a collection of hadith. Every, almost every single story and narration in this book is about those people who traveled far in order to listen to, search and find one single hadith. The whole book is about those who traveled in order to find one hadith. An example is Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu an. Imagine how close he was to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he arrived in Medina. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu an was his first host. He stayed with him, he lodged with him. He had the honor of accommodating him, feeding him. And he was very close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet despite that closeness throughout his life, despite knowing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and being so close to him for so many years after he had passed away, the love of the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the love of hadith, spurred Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu an to travel all the way from Medina to Egypt on camel. That long journey through the desert. Why? In order to discover a hadith which he didn't know? No. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu an had heard one hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And after he had passed away, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu an knew the hadith, he had memorized it, but he could not find anyone else who had also heard the hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just as he had done so. So merely to corroborate his own hearing the hadith, he made inquiries. He was in no doubt but he wanted to find someone else who had also heard it. He learns that one of the companions in Egypt 
had heard the hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu and traveled from Medina mounting his camel all the way to Egypt searched for the companion and when he met him and he was greeted for he was revered even amongst the companions he said my only purpose for traveling to you is to corroborate this particular hadith which I heard from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have you heard it also? And when the companion said, yes, I have, and the hadith was, part of the hadith is, وَمَنْ سَتَرَ مُسْلِمًا سَتَرَهُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Whoever conceals the faults of a Muslim in the world, Allah will conceal their faults on the day of reckoning. So when he heard that, indeed, the other companion had heard this hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to one narration of the story, he said, Allah, he exclaimed, Allahu Akbar, and turned around and headed back to Medina. All for the sake of one hadith. There are other accounts of other companions, Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu an, and others. This love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his words is what stirred and spurred the companions and those who came after them throughout the centuries. And this is why the ulama of Islam originated from and travelled all over the Muslim world in order to listen to, learn, collect record, preserve, and teach and convey the words and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I've always mentioned a remarkable story which illustrates this from Europe. Imam Baqi ibn Makhlad and Andalusi rahmatullahi alayhi. A scholar from Europe, Spain, Qurtuba, Cordoba. He heard in the third century he heard about Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi teaching in Baghdad. In those days, Baghdad was the jewel of the east and Qurtuba was the jewel of the west. These two beautiful cities with thousands of minarets, libraries, centers of learning and civilization. And in both, along with science, along with astronomy, along with all the sciences that eventually led to the Renaissance in Europe, along with Hellenistic philosophy and the translation and the conveying of works from Rome and Greece and historical times and classic, from the classical era. Along with all of this, the peak of learning was considered the study of the Qur'an and the study of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Imam Baqi ibn Makhlad and Andrusi from Qurtuba, he heard about Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi teaching hadith. He made a vow to Allah that, oh Allah, I will travel in order to hear hadith. And I will travel all the way from Qurtuba to Baghdad on foot. And he did it. South from Qurtuba, across the Mediterranean, Strait of Gibraltar, to Northern Africa trekking across the whole of northern Africa on foot through Egypt, the Sinai Peninsula, through, sorry, through Egypt and then through modern-day Palestine, Jordan, through the Iraqi and Jordanian desert, all the way up to Baghdad. But just before he reached Baghdad, he heard that Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal was imprisoned. When he arrived in Baghdad, he decided, what shall I do? Shall I return or shall I continue? Then he decided, I've come this far, let me continue. He went. Went to Baghdad. Arriving in Baghdad, he made inquiries by Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. He was told that he's not imprisoned, but he has been placed under house arrest and banned from teaching hadith. He was so eager to learn, he went to Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal's house, knocked on the door. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal opened the door and he actually said to him, why have you come here? Don't you know I have been placed under house arrest? You shouldn't be seen speaking to me. So Baqi ibn Makhlad and Andalus said, oh Imam, I've come to hear hadith from you. He said, I am banned from teaching hadith. So he said, Imam, please teach me, I've come from very far. So he said, where have you come from? He said, I've come from very far. He said, have you come from northern... Northern Africa, meaning Maghrib, Al Maghrib al Arabi. Have you come from the Maghrib? And he said, No, even further, meaning Spain. 
So he said, indeed, you have come from very far. He said, truthfully speaking, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal said, I would love to teach you, but I have been barred from teaching. So what can I do? Baqi ibn Makhlad al said, oh Imam, if I employ some strategy and means to come to you, will you teach me at least one or two hadith a day? He said, fine, do what you have to, but it has to remain confidential. And this conversation took place not all at the door, because when he met him, he said, don't you know I've been barred from meeting, speaking? So he said, Imam, I've come to listen to hadith. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal dragged him into the side corridor of the house. Then this conversation took place. So Baqi ibn Makhlad al Andalusi then took up residence in Baghdad, disguised himself as a beggar, carrying a tin with a stick and wearing coarse clothes. And then he would wander the streets of Baghdad pretending to be a beggar, go to the alley of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, shout out shay'an lillah, shay'an lillah, someone give me something for the sake of Allah, rattle his can. And then he would go to the house of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal would open the door. People would assume this is a beggar. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal would pull him to the side corridor. Standing there, Baqi ibn Makhlad and Lusi, they used to have very large sleeves. So in his sleeves, he had hidden scrolls of paper, ink pots and pens, quilts. He would pull out all his material, stand in front of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal would then relate the hadith with the sanad all the way to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Baqi ibn Makhlid al Andalusi would quickly record a hadith, two, three hadith every single day in this manner until he had a large collection of over 300 hadith. Then Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal was eventually given permission to once again teach. When he did, Imam Baqi ibn Makhlid studied with him. And Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal honoured him. Baqi ibn Makhlid then returned to Qurtuba and then undertook a second journey again on foot to the lands of Islam in order to hear hadith. What this eventually led to is the Musnad of Baqi ibn Makhlid al Andalusi. The ulama of Islam say that his collection of hadith is the largest collection of hadith known to the Muslims. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal's own collection of hadith is approximately just over 27,000. But Imam Baqi ibn Makhlid and Lusi's collection and his Musnad of Hadith is greater than that of even Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal in number. Unfortunately, with the trials and the tragedies of time, that collection has been lost. It's not available anywhere. It was destroyed not only in the Mongol attacks on Baghdad, but also in the Inquisition in Spain. The largest collection of hadith known to us. But we pray, just as many other works of Islam have come to light, we pray that somewhere, someone has copies of this remarkable manuscript and collection of Baqi ibn Makhlid al Anglusi. For if they do, Allahu Akbar, that would be a day of delight for the believers. Because it actually is a larger collection than even that of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal in his Musnad. This was the love of hadith. And as Mufti Abdul Rahman was saying earlier, it's one of the key features of Islam that from the very beginning, the scholars who've preserved the knowledge of the Quran, of Arabic, of fiqh, of hadith, even of the Arabic language, even of the Arabic language, are foreigners. The greatest dictionary in Islam, in Arabic, is Daj al Arus. من جواهر القاموس by Imam Ali Imam Murtada al Zabidi rahmatullahi alayhi. Imam Murtada al Zabidi rahmatullahi alayhi is buried in Yemen, uh, in Cairo, in Egypt, but he came from India. Murtada al Zabidi came from India. And the Sibuay and the earliest grammarians were all non Arab. And similarly, most of the muhaddithin, the scholars of hadith, were non-Arabs. And as part of that tradition, hadith reached the Indian subcontinent and the ulama served in the field of hadith in the Indian subcontinent. In the, when was hadith first introduced to the Muslims in India? From the very beginning. Let me share one or two things with you. Imam Tirmidhi, 
and others, Imam Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah alayhima, have a narrator in their chain known as Ar Rabi' ibn Sabih. Ar Rabi' ibn Sabih was one of the greatest scholars in Basra, one of the students of Imam al Hassan al Basri, and he was actually the Shaykh and the teacher of, the pe pe of people of such caliber like Imam Waqi' ibn al Jarrah and Sufyan al Thawri and others. Imam al Rabi' ibn al Sabih, it said of him that he was one of the first, if not the first, scholar in Islam to actually make a categorized collection of hadith. Definitely one of the first, if not the first. But definitely one of the first. And he died in 160 Hijri. But where did he die? Even though he was one of the greatest scholars and the pious individuals of Basra in Iraq, he traveled to India and he died there. One of the narrators of Ibn Majah and Tirmidhi. And Imam Bukhari also mentions him in, in, in Bukhari, but not as one of the Muslim Muttasil narrations. He mentions him ta'aliqan. Uh, I won't explain. The ulama and the talaba understand. Another famous narrator of hadith, Imam Abu Musa Israel ibn Musa. Imam, he is found in the narrations and in the chains of transmission in Bukhari, in Ahmad ibn Hanbal's Musnad in Abu Dawood, in Tirmidhi, in Nasa'i. Again, he was a famous scholar. He was the teacher of Imam Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan, the teacher of both Sufyan al-Thawri and Sufyan ibn Uyayna. And again, he himself was a student of Imam al-Hassan al-Basri and Ibn Sirin, rahmatullahi alayhim ajma'in. He was also a regular visitor and then eventually a resident of India. So hadith was introduced in the very earliest days whilst Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi, was compiling and teaching his muwatta in Medina. Imam al rabi ibn Sabih had already reached India with his hadith and he had also died there. So hadith was introduced from the very beginning of the introduction of Islam to India. And throughout the centuries, though with some waning and rise and fall, and with an increase and decrease, hadith was always an integral part of learning in India. But it was only in the later centuries that India produced some great scholars in the field of hadith. Uh, like I said, I don't want to just bore you with a list of names and numbers and facts and figures, but to give you just select examples, one of the famous scholars of India, someone who lived and for a long time and worked and taught and wrote in Gujarat of India. Two famous scholars, teacher and student. They are of the 10th century. Rashid Ridha, one of the scholars of Egypt, he actually says that when Hadith was dying out in the Arab world in the 10th century, it was the ulama of the Indian subcontinent who saved and revived the Hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the 10th century were two key figures that we know very well today. Imam Ali Muttaqi al-Hindi and his student, Muhammad Tahir al-Batni rahimahullah. Both of these scholars, especially Imam Ali Muttaqi al-Hindi, what was his contribution? As far as the large works of hadith are concerned, of course, each author has a particular purpose in the collection of hadith. So Imam Bukhari has a particular purpose. Otherwise, he had memorized hundreds of thousands of hadith. In fact, word is that Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi knew over a million hadith by heart. And when we say a million or a few hundred thousand hadith, we're not talking about the text. Because as far as the body of hadith is concerned, the actual text is concerned, there are only a few thousand hadith. But in the science of hadith, since the ulama do not differentiate between the text and the matn of the hadith and the sanad and its chain of transmission, because it's such an important part of learning in Islam, each text, even if it's identical to the next one, if it has a slight variation in the names of the narrators, then it's considered a separate hadith. So in that way, with the text and with separate chains of narration, it's, re it's reported that Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi knew over a million hadith by heart. 
And that's not surprising at all. So he had a particular purpose. That's why his collection has only a few thousand hadith, and even they are repeated. And similarly with the other scholars. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi, had a very large collection because his purpose was different. His purpose was to include every hadith from every companion radiyallahu anhu. And that's why his musnad contains over 27,000 hadith. Some of these are additions from his son Abdullah. But the largest single collection of hadith which we have, which combines all the narrations, is the Qanzul Ummal. And Qanzul Ummal actually contains just under 47,000 narrations. Not all of them are murfu' hadith, but they are narrations, 47,000. When was this compiled? It actually is a rearranging and a reordering of a few other works. But when was this completed and by who? This was completed in the 10th century and in India and by an Indian scholar, Imam Ali Muttaqi al-Hindi rahmatullahi alayhi. The largest collection of hadith is by Imam Ali Muttaqi al-Hindi. And moving on over throughout the centuries, the works continue till today. Each century had great luminaries in hadith in the Indian subcontinent and amazing unprecedented works. Even in this day and age, recently there's been a proliferation of hadith and the commentaries of hadith. Especially in the past century and a half. We have commentaries of every major book of hadith by the scholars of India. And just to mention names, for instance, we have commentaries on the Muwatta, short commentaries by Shah Waliullah Dehlawi, Salamullah Dehlawi, Rahmatullahi Alayhim, and then the Muwatta of Imam Muhammad, a lengthy commentary by Imam Mawlana Abdul Hayy al Laknawi. We have other commentaries as well in Persian, in Urdu, and in Arabic. These are Arabic ones uh, that I've mentioned. Imam, Imam Bukhari's collection, you have numerous commentaries, numerous. And one of the more famous commentaries of Muwatta, of Imam Malik, is a very lengthy one by Sheikh al-Hadith Mawlana Muhammad Zakariya, rahmatullahi alayhi, one of the recent scholars. And then same, with each collection, Bukhari, you have countless commentaries, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Nasay, all the collections. I won't go into the names, I'll just end with one or two comments. One is that the teaching of hadith in the Indian subcontinent over the past few centuries has been a very unique one, even now in universities and centres of learning in other parts of the world. The tradition of teaching hadith in the original manner has, was mainly lost, but it was preserved by the ulama of the Indian subcontinent. Elsewhere, the manner of learning and teaching hadith, and even till now, was that Someone told me about a course that they studied in one of the most prominent universities of specialising in hadith. But the manner of specialising in hadith is that they would study 40 hadith in one year. And they would study each hadith with its text and with its chains, but only 40 hadith in one year. But the ulama of the Indian subcontinent have preserved that tradition of studying the entire book. And this is what the ulama have always done. And this, con this tradition continues in the madaris and in all of the Darul Ulooms, where the whole book is completed. So if you're studying Bukhari, in fact, an in, in the madaris of the Indian subcontinent, in the seminaries, a person is not considered an alim or a graduate until they've studied all of the main books of hadith in their entirety. In their entirety. And not just a reading, but with thorough commentary, understanding and analysis. And this unique method has been preserved by the ulama of the Indian subcontinent, along with ijazah and along with a whole continuous uninterrupted chain from themselves all the way to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'll end here. There's a lot that can be said. I didn't just want to give you a list of names and scholars and books. Like I said, that's more appropriate for a written piece on this topic. If I had more time, I would have mentioned the calibre of some of the recent scholars, Allahu Akbar. They didn't just write commentaries. 
Each of these scholars of the recent past who've written commentaries and who've done work on hadith had unique abilities, unique abilities. And not just in terms of textual analysis and commentary, but uh, in terms of memorization of hadith. Shah, Wali, uh, Shah Imam Ahmed al-Sarhindi, his grandson was someone called Farooq Shah, he was a scholar, he knew 70,000 hadith by heart, not just with the text, but with the chains of narration, along with the biographical information on each of the narrators of 70,000 hadith by heart. And recently, Hazrat Mawlana Abdullah Darkhasti, who passed away, was also someone from Pakistan, someone who had memorized thousands and thousands of hadith and was able to recite them like reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. So in terms of memorization, understanding, propagation, preservation, and commentary, the ulama of the Indian subcontinent have made a very remarkable and valuable contribution to hadith. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us also with the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to study his words and his life and to make a humble contribution in the field of hadith ourselves by whichever way it may be, by learning, by supporting, by preservation, or by even teaching. Sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasooli nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.